Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hazel. I am a junior studying history and political science, and it is my pleasure today to introduce Mr. William K. Riley. Mr. Riley has enjoyed careers in public service, non-governmental organizations, and private sector finance. For more than 20 years, he was a senior advisor to TPG Capital and an, an international investment partnership. During his tenure with TPG, he was the founding partner and CEO of Aqua International Partners, a private equity fund dedicated to investing in companies in the water sector. Before joining TPG, Mr. Riley was the first Payne visiting prof professor at Stanford University. He served as the administrator of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency from 1989 to 1993 under President George H.W. Bush, during which he led efforts to pass a new Clean Air Act and headed the U.S. delegation to the U.N. Conference on, Environmental, on Environment and Development in Rio in 1992. He served as president of the World Wildlife Fund and later as chairman of the board, president of the Conservation Foundation, and director of the Rockefeller Task Force on Land Use and Urban Growth. Mr. Riley is the chairman of the board of the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions at Duke University. He has chaired the board of the Global Water Challenge and Climate Works Foundation. Mr. Riley serves also on the executive committee of the U.S. Water Partnership, the board of the Center of Strategic and International Studies, and on the board of the Union of Concerned Scientists. He has also served on several corporate boards, including DuPont, uh, ConocoPhillips, and Royal Caribbean. From 1970 to 1972, he was a senior staff member at the White House Council on Environmental Quality. President Clinton appointed Mr. Riley as a founding trustee as the of the Presidio Trust of San Francisco. President Obama appointed him co-chair of the National Commission on the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill and the future of offshore drilling. And in late 2012, to the Pre President's Global Development Council, for which he headed the working group on climate and smart food security. He served in the US Army to the rank of captain from 1966 to 1968, and he and his wife, Elizabeth, reside in San Francisco. Please join me in giving Mr. Riley a warm welcome. Good afternoon. My name is Natalia Bard. I am a Davis Scholar majoring in economics, and it is my honor to welcome Mr. John Podesta to the Albright Institute today. Thank you. Mr. Podesta's career is wide ranging and spans close to 50 years of public service. He is known for his leadership roles at the White House, but few are aware of his effective advocacy on environmental issues. John Podesta was raised in Chicago and was drawn to politics while at Knox College. Shortly after graduating, Mr. Podesta worked for George McGovern's pres presidential campaign and in 1976 received his JD from Georgetown University. At his alma mater, he has taught classes on congressional investigations, law and technology, legislation, copyright, and public interest law. Mr. Podesta is best known for serving as the Chief of Staff for President Bill Clinton, founding the Center for American Progress, chairing President Obama's transition team, and chairing Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. What is less known is his quiet leadership on environmental issues. Mr. Podesta can list some remarkable achievements. During the Obama administration, he became the point person for the administration's climate policy, which culminated in the Paris Climate Accord. He direct, directly had a hand in six national monuments Obama has created, including the country's largest marine reserve, the Pacific Remote Islands National Monument, and steered a landmark climate deal with China to control greenhouse gas, as well as the first proposal to regulate climate emissions from U.S. coal-fired power plants. Add in his record under Bill Clinton the sweeping 2001 roadless rule protecting 58 million acres administered by the U.S. Forest Service and the 19 national monuments and conservation areas. He and his wife Mary Podesta, a Washington, D.C. attorney, have recently celebrated their 40th wedding anniversary <laughs> and have three children and two grandchildren. He is an avid cook and one of our current Albright Fellows was lucky to learn the beet risotto recipe <laughs> directly from Chef Podesta. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Mr. John Podesta. Thank you. God, I, I didn't know all that. <laughs> Thank you, Natalia. Hello everyone, my name is Maggie Ugolstad. I'm a computer science major here at Wellesley, and my colleague Ali wrote this lovely introduction I am reading to you today. <laughs> Professor, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce you today 
to today, Professor Jay Turner. Professor Turner is the director of the environmental studies here at Wellesley and has been teaching at the college since 2006. He teaches courses on environmental history, U.S. environmental politics, environmental communication through public writing, and core courses on climate change. He also sits on many college committees, including ones dealing with Wellesley's energy future and sustainability. Professor Turner's research has focused on American environmental politics over the last half century. His most recent publication was co a co-authored book titled The Republican Reversal, Conservatives and the Environment from Nixon to Trump. This timely book explores the evolution of conservative opposition to environmental reform, beginning with Nixon's support for key environmental laws in the early 1970s and culminating in the Republican reversal exemplified by the Trump administration's aggressively anti-environmental policies. I can think of few people better to be able to contextualize the state of our current environment policy debate and look forward to hearing per from Professor Turner and other panelists. Please join me in warmly welcoming Professor Jay Turner. Thank you all for those really generous introductions. John, Phil, it's a real pleasure to have you here at Wellesley and here to be a part of the Albright Institute. It's an opportune, not just time, but day to be talking about environmental politics. Just this morning, the Senate was holding confirmation hearings for Andrew Wheeler to be the next administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency. So the chance to take a step back, think about the past and the future of environmental politics um, is, is welcome <laughs> at this particular moment. And it's hard to imagine two people better to have this conversation with. When Bill was at the EPA, and you, um, so many kind of key things were already covered in this introduction, but one of the last great bipartisan accomplishments uh, for environmental protection was the Clean Air Act of 1990. And Bill had a uh, direct hand in bringing this legislation to fruition in the early 1990s. And during the Clinton and the Obama administration, John played a key role in pushing for administrative efforts to protect public lands, to advance climate change policy through executive orders, rulemakings, and international negotiations. So in short, John and Bill have played a key role on the front lines of environmental politics and can help us think about where we've been and where it is that we're headed. So the general plan for our conversation this afternoon is to start off First talking about, this is my plan, you all may take it in a different direction, but to start off thinking about the past, how we got to this moment where environmental politics is you know, one of these partisan, uh, you know, politically divisive issues, kind of how we got to this moment politically. Think about um, how climate change negotiations have evolved historically, what brought us to the Paris Climate Accord. And then in this moment, and kind of turning from the past and looking towards the future, thinking about this moment when the current administration is opposed to an action on climate change, what are the other pathways? What are the other options for moving climate policy and energy reform together? So I imagine talking through some of these points will keep us busy for 45 minutes or so, and then we'll turn to you all for um, some questions and discussion for another 15 or 20 minutes after that. So I've got some questions here that I want to throw out. And um, I was thinking, Bill, I'd start with you, and then John um, turn to you, but feel free to jump in, either of you, as we go. And it just, you know, Bill, as the introduction mentioned, you got your start in environmental politics in the 1970s. And I was hoping you could just take us back um, to that moment in US history when the environment was a new issue. The Nixon administration was signing laws like the Clean Air Act, the Environmental Protection Agency, had just been created. I mean, these are, this is a foundational moment in U.S. environmental politics. And if you could you know, give us a sense for what it was like to be in Washington at that moment. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jay. First, let me say uh, it's an honor to be in this group. I don't think I've ever looked at a group that seemed more energetic and eager <laughs> than the one that I'm looking at right now. It is inspiring and energizing to look at you. And it's an honor to be on here with John. If you wanted anything done on the environment in the Obama administration, John was the go-to guy. And I, uh, I was in a position to know that. So um, I'm very pleased to be part of this. The uh, story goes that candidate Richard Nixon 
sat down in uh, preparing for his campaign in 1968 and was shown a poll that indicated the top three issues of concern to the American people were the war in Vietnam, the state of the economy, and the environment. The environment had never played at that level before. And he gave the word to John Whitaker and John Ehrlichman, get out front on the environment. And when he took office, he sat down and he, with one of these yellow pads, and he wrote out 14 issues. And he drew a line under four. And he said, uh, and I don't know what they were, one can imagine. Uh, those four issues, I want to be personally involved in everything that moves. The other 10, I want us to be forward leaning. I don't have to be involved, but if it will help or it's necessary, I will be. And so we had a carte blanche at the Council on Environmental Quality. We had a lot of Democrats. I remember we were allowed to hire Democrats because the word went that probably there weren't that many <laughs> Republicans that we could staff the place with. It was a fabulous staff. There were three Rhodes Scholars. There were two Supreme Court clerks. It was just as good a staff as uh, I've ever seen. And uh, we were given the job of preparing the president's legislative program, and we did. And what we prepared is what he proposed. Now, there are a lot of reasons why he would do that, one of which was he expected that his opponent the next election would be Senator Muskie, who was an avatar of environmental reform. And um, the other one was, frankly, that the public was there. And I recently spent a day with the first administrator of EPA, Bill Ruckelshaus, and he said, it's hard to imagine those days. You got up in the morning, and the Congress wanted to know wouldn't you like more money? Uh, how about another law? Have we dealt with noise? Let's, do it. Let's have a bill on noise. And so they would pass these laws. The president would sign them. He uh, declined to sign the first Clean Water Act because it was too expensive, but he clearly was prepared to sign it. And he did sign it when it came back to him as a little, a little more prudent. And that lasted, as far as he was concerned, for the first two years. He personally had very little interest in the environment. Anybody around him would say uh, he came to view environmentalists as hippies, anti-war people, the people who are tearing the country down. And after two years, I remember I was called by someone in the White House, and I was asked to write a speech for the Detroit Economic Pl Club that the president would deliver debunking the environment. And I remember I went downstairs, and I, I was told not to tell my boss. And I went straight downstairs, and I told my boss. <laughs> and I said, I'm not going to write this speech. He said, of course you're going to write the speech. This is a person shrewder than I. He said, think about it. It's the White House. They could have gone anywhere in the administration. They came here. Someone's looking out for us. Someone knows you will write a speech we can live with. At any rate, I wrote the speech, and it was all about reconciling environmental aspirations with economic goals and that sort of thing. And uh, he delivered about two paragraphs of it, as I recall. But he'd gone on to something else by the time he gave the big Detroit speech. But the bloom was off the flower for him personally. And I only learned 10 years ago from my boss, Russell Train, that when he presented my draft of the legislative program on coastal zone management, uh, land use, and historic preservation, the president said, who's the SOB who wrote this? <laughs> Uh, I'm glad he didn't tell me. I was 30, 30 years old or so. Uh, it, it would have been hard to find that that's what the boss really thought of my work. But the interesting thing to me is that whatever his personal feelings, he submitted those pieces of legislative proposals. He stuck with the environment as an issue and decided at some point, obviously, it wasn't working for him politically. But he didn't abandon it. So that's what it was like. And when the Ford administration came in, after uh, Nixon resigned, uh, Russell Train told me that the, the chief of staff was Rumsfeld. And we had the Arab oil embargo, and a number of the economic uh, issues were quite serious. The extraordinary thing about polling data was that it showed that 80-some percent of the American public continued through the downturn and inflation and all the rest, continued to support either the maintenance or the strengthening of the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. That has never changed. That is true today. And so it does raise the question, what's happened? Well, you wrote the book on that, so I won't go any <laughs> further on that. But um, that's what those days were like. And that's where the most of the charters, air, water, toxic substances, endangered species, so many of them came out of those years.
the what happened question is not this question, but the one that comes next. But the, the, I wanted to ask you one more question, Bill, which, you know, just listening to your last response, the, the, the chuckle came when you talked about how it was hard to find Republicans to staff the CEQ. And I think, you know, that plays to the point, and, you know, for a lot of people in the U.S., probably a lot of students at Wellesley, maybe some in the stream, when we think of environmentalists, we don't think of Republicans. But that hasn't been the case historically. And I think George H.W. Bush's administration, which you were the EPA administrator for, right, is kind of the best example example we have of this. And so, you know, why was it that the environment was such an important issue for George H.W. Bush and the work that his administration was, was doing? Well, I remember someone who's very close to him, Bob Teeter was his pollster, said that throughout the Reagan years, Bush was extremely circumspect about differing with Reagan on anything. He said the only exception was the environment. He would say to the people who were planning his campaign, I'd like to be more out front on the environment. And he had a personal interest in it. He cared about it. He was an outdoorsman. I remember when, uh, when one of the aides to Clinton uh, told me as we discussed, I said, so what's your guy like? What's he going to be like? He said, well, he's not an outdoorsman like your man. He said, I think he likes golf courses. <laughs> <laughs> the, the issue for Bush, and I think it was, a, it, it was a stroke of political tactical genius, Bush recognized that he had to distinguish himself from Reagan and be his own person. But he couldn't do it too obviously. He famously said that he wanted a kinder, gentler America. And Mrs. Reagan was quoted as saying, kinder and gentler than who? <laughs> <laughs> well, he uh, recognized that um, to do that, some issues would be, would be very appropriate. And the issue that they chose was the environment. And he famously swooped into Boston Harbor to publicized how dirty it was, how this, this contradicted the image that Dukakis, the governor of Massachusetts, wanted to have on the environment. This was his home, his home state, his home town, and look at the mess that things were in and what had he done about it. And so there was a lot of exaggeration in that, but it was basically true that the harbor was a mess, and we did clean it up on our watch. The um, um, fact was that politically it worked extremely well and from a from a, a demographic point of view as was explained to me by Lee Atwater who was the head of the Republican Party the, I think he was chairman of his campaign and also uh, a very shrewd uh, op operator politically he once explained that Bush did not have ethnic Irish and Italian working class voters they were not part of his base they had been the part of Reagan's base what he had was suburban women. And as Atwater put it to me, suburban women have two issues. Choice is one we cannot accommodate them on. The president can't change his position on that. And Lord help us if we get a Supreme Court nomination. Of course they did, Clarence Thomas. But he said the other issue of interest to them is your issue, the environment. And so to the extent that, uh, that you need help, I'm going to help you. And this was a man who had no interest in issues whatsoever other than as a political proposition. <laughs> so I think that explains both the personal interest of the president in the outdoors and in, um, in the political utility of claiming to have a uh, promote a new Clean Air Act. And a very specific promise it was uh, to deal with uh, ground level ozone or smog, to deal with toxic uh, air emissions, and most famously, acid rain. I talked to Senator George Mitchell recently and asked him about uh, the whole history and he said, you know, I never believed that Bush would succeed in getting a Clean Air Act through the Congress. I was very surprised. It was a very creative design. It was when, when uh, people were open to different and imaginative ways to have incentives, market-based pollution trading, and things of that sort. And uh, so it could be claimed among the people in the White House who had no interest really in the Clean Air Act, well, this is a novel Republican approach to the Clean Air Act, which it was. And it managed to unite people. So we had 89 to 11 in the Senate who finally voted for it. It seems like a different era in, in environmental it is a different politics. Era. It is yes, a different is. era. So this is the what happened 
question. Um, you know, what, what did happen? You know, what explains kind of this gulf between what was happening in the early 1990s and today in environmental politics? And you know, I wonder, you know, is this about the structure? And John, I'm looking to you to chime in here too, but you know, is this about the structure of issues changing, going from local to being more global? Is it a consequence of the success of these laws that were put in place in the 1970s and actually addressing many environmental issues? Or you know, maybe it's a change in politics and the rise of interest groups and, you know, the gathering strength of lobbies and fossil fuel interests. But yeah, kind of that broader question of, you know, what did happen and when did it happen? Um. Yeah, I had been on the, uh, in the congressional staff uh, during a lot of the period that, that um, Bill was describing uh, and then went to work for President Clinton in 1992. So I, I'm like kind of li living this real time. <laughs> uh, before I get started though, I have to establish my Wellesley bona fides. Bring it on. <laughs> which is... My, uh, one of those three kids that was mentioned in my introduction is a 2002 uh, graduate. And the person who's been um, my partner uh, at the Center for American Progress and at the White House, before that at the UN working on the SDGs, is sitting in the back of the room, Christina Costa, we're working together again, who's a 2009 graduate of Wellesley. So I had to embarrass her in front, in front of you all. Uh, but we, we were, uh, worked for President Obama together to do things that, that uh, got mentioned at the beginning. Um, I think uh, a, a little bit of all of that happened. Uh, first of all, the structure of politics became much more partisan. That was, I think, a function of the Gingrich takeover of the Republican Party in the House uh, initially. Um, the, so uh, what had been... Uh, what had been a, uh, a way of working and finding honest compromise between the parties, including really even under uh, President Reagan, where he famously had a decent relationship with Speaker of the House Tip O'Neill, who is uh, from Cambridge, uh, and they could work together on certain things. That kind of disintegrated in the 1990s when Gingrich took over uh, first uh, with an assault on the Republican leadership, who he viewed as too accommodating, uh, and then uh, that created a, a structure in which the politics of the country really became uh, the distribution of, of uh, voters, if you will, became bimodal. So Democrats became much more consolidated on the left. It became a ide more ideological party. Uh, uh, Republicans became a more ideological party on the right. Uh, leadership ended up uh, being dominantly from the South. Uh, the change of, uh, of the structure of politics after the Civil Rights Act began to have its effect over a period, it took a while uh, from the 1960s all the way through to the mid-1990s for what had been a solid Democratic South to become essentially a solid Republican South. Much more conservative, uh, much more um, uh, in opposition uh, to what progressive governance kind of looked like. And uh, Clinton, who had been a successful governor from Arkansas uh, and had dealt with um, a, you know, having to live in a context in which there were lots of conservative voters in his state, I think was even, even he was surprised at how contentious and how uh, driven and divided a uh, politics became. Uh, in his first years in office, um, Clinton's economic program, which led to a long period, uh, at least in my view, uh, of substantial economic growth uh, with substantial progress on the environment as well was passed by a single vote in the House and a single vote in the Senate with no Republicans supporting him. Fast forward to uh, President Obama's experience coming in in 2009, same picture. Uh, parties in strict opposition to one another, almost a parliamentary system, displaced what had been uh, a system in which you know, there used to be conservative Demo Democrats and liberal Republicans and those the, that, that center got hollowed out. This last election kind of furthered that in a way because the people who, the few Republicans who were targets for, uh, uh, particularly on the environment, who 
were willing to mm -hmm. try to find some honest compromise, largely where the people got beat in this last election. Uh, the, the members in Orange County, the ones in New Jersey, the uh, ones out in upstate New York and Pennsylvania. Those were those suburban districts that Bush understood, that, that H.W. Bush understood he needed uh, have now, you know, as a result of the 2018 election, moved further away from Trump further towards the, uh, the Democrats. So one part is just uh, a, a, you know, and the, but you can go issue by issue and the same pattern uh, exists. Uh, I have a friend uh, who you, you probably know, Jay, uh, uh, Rich Lazarus, who's a professor at Harvard Law School, who studied the voting patterns of members going back to the 1970s, going back to 1970, when he was at Georgetown and has uh, continued to be an important voice on this. And uh, during the 1970s and 1980s, predictions about how you voted on the environment had a lot more to do with what region of the country you were from than it did to do with what party you were from. That has completely changed. So uh, no matter where you're from, uh, with the possible exception of Joe Manchin, uh, no matter, and I, I don't even think that's true of Joe Manchin. Uh, he, Joe Manchin, who's the, now the uh, ranking member on the Energy Committee in the Senate, senator from West Virginia, who famously was first elected uh, by uh, putting up a target with cap and trade on it and shooting a gun through the bullseye of cap and trade. And he had another is, bullseye, which was EPA. <laughs> is more, he's more pro-environment in his voting record than probably all but is one true? Republican. Really? Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, so the parties have divided on this question. I don't think that's actually good for the country, but it's, but it's sort of a fact of life. It's, it's, uh, that hasn't completely taken place at the subnational level. So Governor Baker is you know, pretty good on this uh, set of issues. Uh, the governor of Maryland, the governor of Vermont, they still have to live in a political world where they're still essentially uh, uh, environmentally sensitive in in the case of uh, mid-atlantic it's more about the Chesapeake Bay and you know up here it's it's climate and and, and those kind of questions um, I think we, we can come back to that yeah kind of what's happening but, below but the federal that government. that split now uh, was accompanied by and I'll just end with this I'm sorry to be long-winded I, I think it was accompanied by a massive investment by the Koch brothers and the fossil fuel industry in changing uh, both public perceptions uh, of, in, of environmental protection and what that might do to economic growth, uh, and certainly the political percep perceptions of people who had to run for office and whether they could survive an onslaught of conservative money coming in against them. Uh, I, I, I will close with this. Um, you mentioned Andrew Wheeler. Andrew Wheeler is no Bill Riley. Uh, you know, he's a coal lobbyist who's been put in, it was put in as deputy EPA administrator uh, because he was more competent than Scott Pruitt, who had been the former attorney general of, um, of uh, Oklahoma, who sort of resigned in disgrace this summer, last summer. Um, but he is... Uh, essentially operating off a wish list of the coal industry, the fossil fuel industry, et cetera. And that's, I think, the result of money in politics, as well as this ideological divide. May I add just one thing to that, which is I, I don't disagree with any of that. Uh, I would just say that I recall a conversation I had with a very impressive member of Congress, Tom Cole from Oklahoma. And uh, the question was Waxman-Markey, the climate bill. And he said to me, if I had voted for Waxman-Markey, I would have been advised to give up on my career, uh, not to have stood in a primary. And I said to him, who cares that much in Oklahoma? And he said, evangelicals. They have two issues, Israel and uh, climate change. And he said, then you dare not be on the wrong side of either of those issues in my district for that reason. And I thought a lot about the degree to which 
evangelicals have been influenced by the Koch brothers or by their publicity or, or and, I, and I'm not entirely sure that it mattered that much to them. I asked him, where are they getting this? And he said, I have no idea from the pulpit, from um, talk radio, but, they, but that's where they are. And that is a very important part of the Republican Party base. And it's essentially, a, a, as near as I can tell, an immovable one. And probably worth mentioning that Scott Pruitt was um, an evangelical yeah. from Oklahoma with connections to that community. Yes. But I think, as you would acknowledge, I mean, the evangelical community is complicated, right? And there are wings of the evangelical community that have pushed for environmental reform, but there's a particular strain that's very much well, opposed if there, to it. Well, if there are, the Republicans are not hearing them. Yeah. So going back one more question about the history and George H.W. Bush's administration that I want to kind of bring up before we start moving forward. So, Bill, looking back to you, in thinking about Bush coming into office, there's kind of a famous quote where concerns were rising about climate change at the time and global warming. This was, you know, late 1980s, early 1990s when climate change was really first put on the international scene. And during the campaign, Bush said that he was going to meet this issue. He was going to meet the greenhouse effect with the White House effect. And he struggled to do this in practice. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about why it seemed like a possibility that he, he could make this statement on the campaign trail. And then you know, the challenges that the administration actually faced. And in what way that prefigures the debates and challenges we're seeing now. Well, the Republican Party during the George H.W. Bush administration gradually eroded out from under Bush very early in his term. He had a proposal that involved a gasoline tax and um, energy tax. And um, the new Speaker of the House, uh, Gingrich, Newt Gingrich, opposed him. Now, those of us who look at the supine acquiescence of Republicans in the Congress to this president, President Trump, are amazed to think that we got so little help from the Gingrich House. But we did. That was a different complexion of the party for reasons that John's described very well. And uh, we could not count on people in a way that we previously had uh, assumed, and most people had assumed, that a Republican president could count on Republican members of the House and Senate. He um, did a great deal on climate. The budget for research and monitoring using NASA, NOAA, National Center for Atmospheric Research, and all of the rest of them, was very substantial during those years. And that was entirely supported. The law that created the four-year review that we just saw the results from, I think, last month that assessed how serious the problems are was a Bush initiative. That also is something he deserves credit for. On the, on the declaration, and then, of course, the Convention on Climate Change, which a proposal I made to him that, that he agreed to, and we did, and we were the first developed nation to submit it to our Senate and get it ratified. The question that he would not face or resolve was to recommend stabilization of greenhouse gases. And we had an analysis, OMB and EPA together, that concluded that we could accommodate a stabilization of greenhouse gases, that is returning it to the 1990 level in the 1990s without any adverse impact on the economy. Uh, frankly, we were wrong about that. We didn't anticipate the rapid growth in the 90s, but we did anticipate that the Clean Air Act eventually would have that result by promoting gas and discouraging coal. And it has come to pass in the 2000s, but it had not come to pass on the time frame that we had, we had expected. I asked Senator George Mitchell, who was majority leader in the Senate, I asked him just last month, if we had um, proposed climate legislation to the Congress after having won on the Clean Air Act, after having defeated Byrd, who was chairman of the Appropriations Committee, and Dingell, chairman of the Commerce Committee, both of whom considered the clean air law anathema, really did not want it to come before the Senate and successfully kept it from coming to the Congress for 13 years. We Dingell's beat, from Michigan uh, was basically the congressman from GM. I, and, and the mid, guy, but. Midwestern Indians. <laughs> but. Yeah, I, I don't agree on the yeah. latter point. But uh, <laughs> but at any rate, the Midwesterners really uh, had their own reasons to follow them on Twitter. not wanting to see acid rain <laughs> legislation. Um, but. The question I had, we beat Dingle and we beat Byrd, and nobody expected us to. And the way we did it was we got Western Republicans 
to make a new coalition, which they didn't see coming. And we did that because we changed the formula for, uh, made it a performance formula rather than a 90% reduction of sulfur in coal. If you had to get a 90% reduction in clean coal as well as dirty coal, there was no advantage to using clean coal. And at uh, any rate, we changed that, and, that, and that, that managed to make Western coal, Wyoming, Utah, New Mexico, uh, much more attractive competitively. And also, it was, it was taken by surface mining, not by deep mining, so it was cheaper to, to extract. At any rate, that's, that's a complicated part of it. But I asked, I asked Mitchell, if we had gone back at that coalition and tried to beat them again on climate, would we have been successful in your view? He said, no. I don't think so. He said, on the other hand, I was very surprised that you succeeded on clean air. So he said, I could be wrong. But um, as far as Bush was concerned, by the time that we were ready to uh, make a decision, and he was confronted with the decision, and I was the only one, Brent Scowcroft supported me too, who supported stabilization of greenhouse gas, the only one. His budget director, his vice president, his chief of staff, his chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, I remember he famously said, this is a bet your economy decision, Mr. President. <laughs> so the president sort of, whoa. Uh, by the time that happened, there was a recession. And um, Pat Buchanan, you may remember, those of you who've read the history, was challenging in the New Hampshire primary and got something like 40% or 35% of the vote against the sitting president in his own party. The Wall Street Journal was beating up on us and beating up on me personally constantly. And uh, it was a tough time for a, a president concerned about his, his conservative base. And it would not have been a popular decision to make in that community by the time that uh, he was confronted with the decision. In fact, he was a little surprised, however, I remember, that the press was so negative when he made the decision not to do it. And I'll never forget uh, what he said at a luncheon. I had had a long luncheon with him alone, and I'd gone over the economics, the politics, the where other countries were. And then when finally he made the decision, then he had another little, this was a little luncheon meeting. And he said, tell me again why it is that we can't do what all these developed countries are doing on this climate thing. I mean, I, I wrote that down. <laughs> and I remember thinking, weren't you there? <laughs> uh, but at any rate, it could have gone the other way. It, that is, the administration might have come out differently. But according to George Mitchell, it would not have mattered. By the way, I differ with a man named Nathaniel Rich, who wrote a recent book, uh, an article, a 30,000 uh, word article in the New York Times Sunday Magazine. He believes that the Bush administration was the last chance the country had to have a bipartisan solution to the climate issue. And that at a minimum, Bush could have given enough cover to future Republicans so that this is not a toxic issue, which it has honestly become. Brad Pitt's going to play um, Bill Riley in the movie. Because <laughs> they're taking that story and making it into a movie. God, I hope so. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Just remarkable to hear you talk about that moment, right, where it seemed that there was this possibility. I mean, you know, Bush really wanted to, you know, think carefully about this decision because it's a commitment that the country has not been able to make since until the Obama administration. When it was done administratively, did we make a formal commitment to reducing greenhouse gas emissions from, from a baseline? And so, John, you came in and, you know, focusing on the Obama administration now, this became a very important issue for for, for the administration, but in very different ways, right? And, and I kind of want you to talk a little bit about the lessons learned, because the first time, it, first term of the Obama administration, it seemed you all were looking for the big kind of climate fix in Congress, right? And then the second term, it becomes a real heavy administrative lift. And so I just wonder if you can, you know, talk about how you saw that playing out and kind of what you learned, you know, what lessons you draw from it now. Try to do the history sort of briefly. Yeah. So um, politics is usually about friction. Uh, so both in the primaries and the general election in 2007 and 2008, uh, the debate was really around health care and providing universal health care. So that was the, f the different variations between then Senator Clinton and Senator Obama and then between Senator Obama and Senator McCain. Uh, Obama had a good climate policy uh, coming into the election, but McCain was for a cap and trade and they never, you know, it, it, was, a, it was not a joined issue. 
So they didn't really talk to the American public that much about it. Um, and so uh, we come into office, Lehman Brothers has happened, the economy's collapsing, 500,000 jobs a month are being lost. Uh, the most important thing that needed to happen was to try to stabilize the economy. Uh, the first down payment on that was a massive stimulus program. Um, and uh, it, at the time, it seemed unbelievably uh, like a huge amount of money. We, it ended up being around $900 billion that was appropriated in the first few weeks of the new Congress after Obama was being elected. Uh, I was running the transition. I had also run the Center for American Progress. We had a whole transition plan for climate change in the economy. That was, I think, fortunate. My uh, colleague and, and, and partner, Carol Browner, went into the White House uh, as the person who was in charge of climate. But that stimulus bill had a huge investment in clean energy. I raised that because it is being used as the analogy to the Green New Deal that uh, that um, is being proposed now, uh, particularly by Congressman Ocasio-Cortez, uh, as the way to deal with this is, not, is less through the regulatory front or through a tax or a price on carbon and more massive investments in clean energy. And so Obama's first inclination was in that space. That is not where the House was, because again, relevant to today, uh, the the Democrats had taken over control in 2006. Uh, then Speaker Pelosi, now Speaker Pelosi, created a, spe a select committee. It was chaired by Congressman Markey, who is now Senator from Massachusetts. They proposed, uh, in the course of their work, a uh, proposal that was essentially a big cap and trade which you probably read about. It's called Waxman Marking. Uh, the House was moving on a plan that was different than where the White House was. And I think with some green lighting from the White House, the House proceeded to develop this legislation, uh, a market mechanism. Uh, it passed, got some Republican votes, mostly Democratic votes, but it did get some Republican votes. Who all lost their and, elections the next time. <laughs> or at least a couple of them did, mm -hmm. English did. Uh, yeah, my friend Tom Perriello. Uh, Go ahead. He is a Democrat. <laughs> oh, but, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but the, at any rate, that, that this bill passed. I think that Obama's political advisors thought he, was, he had to stick with health care. Above all else, he had to pass the Affordable Care Act. And they, A, didn't... They, he both he hadn't promised climate change, and, and um, David Axelrod, who was his counselor, and, and Rahm Emanuel, who was his chief of staff, didn't think the issue relevant to Lee Atwater, didn't think the issue played very well with the American public. So they put no shoulder into passing climate change in the Senate. Uh, the person who led that was also a senator from Massachusetts, uh, John Kerry, who became the Secretary of State. Uh, he tried, but the administration never, never really, I think, saw the politics. Obama gets reelected to the shock and surprise of everybody in the climate community. On, a, on election night in Chicago again, he says, the thing I want to do is tackle the problem of climate change. He hadn't kind of mentioned it in the 2012 election against Romney, but he p puts himself out front and says, I really want to tackle this. Um, I'm, on the, I'm still on the outside at this point, but they began to develop a climate action plan, which was really regulatory in nature, didn't see any opportunity to get. Um, the, at that point, they had a Democratic Senate, still a Republican House. They didn't see how they could get legislation through the Republican House, but they had plenty of authority under the Clean Air Act uh, that bill had fortunately given to them, and the Supreme Court, in a case called Mass versus EPA had uh, permitted them to utilize. Uh, Gina McCarthy, who's now up here at Harvard and is from Massachusetts, was um, the EPA administrator. So we accelerate regulatory action on all fronts. That's where I go, came back to the White House because he asked me to come back 
and basically run of all of government from DOD to EPA, everybody's going to have do their bit for uh, emissions reductions, and uh, including on the international side, where Obama became not only critical to the development of Paris, but it, it became a high priority for him in all of his interactions and in the development of relationships with President Xi, Prime Minister Modi, uh, the, uh, the then uh, president of Brazil, the, the, uh, the president of Mexico. He was fully engaged in the diplomatic effort to say we can all do more. Uh, we're doing our bit in the U.S., and we can, we can bring this thing together, most famously and most importantly, uh, developed and did a joint announcement in Beijing in 2014 in the run-up uh, to Paris with President Xi, where both countries put their commitments on the table that shocked the world, uh, was a spark plug for the Paris negotiations, and ultimately people followed suit, put ambitious proposals on the table, not enough to to fix the problem or to hold the, not really enough to hold the uh, global average temperature to two degrees C, but began the ratcheting of activity from the EU, from, uh, from countries around the world. But that was like a full commitment by the president. And then obviously with President Trump, we have exactly the reverse dynamic going on. Coming up to present you know, and thinking about the Trump administration and just the politics of climate change now, I mean, when you all look at how the administration's playing climate, you know, is it the culmination of kind of something that's been building amongst conservative Republicans, kind of going all the way back to um, you know, the 1990s, or is you know, there something new about how Trump and his advisors are spinning this issue? I have a view about that, maybe, uh, maybe I'll go first. I think Trump used this as just part of, I mean, he, you know, he got onto it because he found uh, that this was a way of, st of stimulating votes in, in the industrial Midwest, and particularly in West Virginia. And, you know, his love of coal miners was probably didn't precede his running for president, but, you know, he, he found this as a way. But I think what fundamentally drives that is a critique of elites. It's a it's a at base not an environmental analysis, not an economic analysis, not an you know he's embracing the past economy, he's giving up on all the future industries. I don't think it's a kind of intellectual exercise that we really ought, ought to hold on to coal mining uh, and 19th century power sources. It's a way of of it 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 is a uh, it is a massive symbol of. I'm against all these people who have not do, done anything for you uh, and they think they're smarter than you are uh, and I'm kind of on your side and we're against them because they haven't delivered for you. And it's, not, it's nothing really more than that, but he's taken it on with a vengeance mm -hmm. and now I think he you know, doubles and triples down. There's some part of it that's also, again, goes back to money and politics and, mm -hmm. you know, Murray Cole and the support that he's gotten from, from not so much the Kochs, but from other fossil fuel interests. Mm -hmm. But I think mostly it is a uh, fulcrum for an anti-elite message that, you know, these people think they're so smart, they're telling you what's, what's going on. You know, I don't believe it. It's a Chinese plot, all that stuff. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's raw populist politics. You saw it play out in Brazil uh, in the last election. So uh, the new president of Brazil, Bolsonaro, who described himself as the Trump of Brazil, uh, made the same play, just rejected hold, hosting the COP in Brazil, is likely to reverse decades of protection of the Amazon. Uh, but I think he's really running the same play as Trump did. I would just add two things. One, I think it matters to part of his base, as I described Tom Cole's characterization of his own district. I think that the people that he is pursuing, the Tea Party people, the uh, evangelicals, a lot of Southerners, mm -hmm. um, anti-elitist, but also ideologically 
unaccepting of the idea that we can take upon ourselves what is to some a divine uh, power. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of it. It does work for him. But secondly, I have to say, I read these polls that show that a majority of Americans, even a majority of Republicans, believe that the climate is changing and that humans are influencing that change. And then I talk to members of Congress. They're never asked about it on the stump. Nobody's voting climate. It comes down, it's uh, eight or 10 or 12 in the list of concerns that the public has. So the honest and very unhappy truth, the country doesn't care that much. I'm afraid that's the reality. If the country cared, we'd have something by now. We'd be doing something at least. And there's so many things we could do that would not be destructive of the economy, that would not really cause people to lose jobs. I mean, vast increases in acceleration of um, renewables is one. We're not doing those things. And we're not doing those things because honestly, Americans are not that interested. This doesn't buck uh, John's point about- I, I wouldn't uh, say Americans are not that. I agree, basically agree with that point. Uh, but you see where you see the action at the subnational level, that's where people care. Okay, about. and I was saying, <laughs> you know, you know, to be on so, a to be on a college campus, people quite care a lot. And you know, and you go to you know New York as part of the climate march, and three hundred thousand people are there. You know, it seems people care a lot. But you know, there are a lot of people who. But the don't Republican this, governor of Vermont like, wouldn't be a, wouldn't be the governor very long if he didn't care about climate change. You know, so so. But it's 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 definitely I think as a. It's, it's regional and it's, and it's impact. Yeah, and I don't want to overdo it. Uh, it's certainly true that um, uh, we're still in, which is something I've been very involved with. We're Wildlife Fund led a campaign to remind the world, and it's very important to remind the world. Those of you who come from other countries, I, when I was in India last, I heard from any number of people that America had given up on climate. Well, that's what the Indian coal lobby would like people to believe, but it's not true. We're doing a great deal. And prudent mayors, the Chicago, New York, Seattle, San Francisco, uh, others, uh, are doing things on climate. They really are. And uh, they deserve to be recognized. They're going to make a difference. And these are mayors. Uh, Mayor Daley was one who did any number of very significant things, 1996 already. And Mayor Daley was not known as being a kind of blindly uh, green enthusiast. He. Uh, he recognized that the climate was changing, the kind of trees that are planted now in the parks of Chicago. 2,200 trees are planted every year. They no longer plant maple, ash, uh, spruce, because they're not gonna make it in the new climate zone. Uh, you know, doesn't that suggest something? Well, in other words, you can't, as a rational person, deny that something's happening. And farmers don't deny it, and weather people don't deny it. They do, some of them, deny that humans are, are causing it. But uh, I, I, w I, I would support what John just said. There is a very substantial local government interest, just in, in a prudential one. You take a place like Miami, we have a governor, or rather a senator, Marco Rubio, who pre I, I picture him standing on the shores of Miami Beach pushing back the waves. Meanwhile, they've invested $500 million in pumps, which a deal with what looks like Venice if you go there after a major rainstorm. I mean, seriously, the, the major thoroughfares are flowing in water. And that's what's happening. The ocean is taking over. And the United States Senator from Florida doesn't get it. I mean, he probably does, well, but let's, he let's, doesn't let's, act let's, on it. Let's talk more about this and kind of maybe, for, you know, we should kind of assume that we're never gonna get big action at the federal level in this country, that it's all going to hinge on action that happens at the sub-federal level. And I mean, these are all examples of adaptation to climate change, but I mean, is that what we can expect at the local level? Or, you know, are there other ways that the clean energy economy addressing climate change can be moved forward that we need to be thinking about um, at the local or the oh, state for sure. level, We're and get in adaptation. the private sector as well. We're gonna have to get adaptation. For the coastal cities, no question, there will be, I mean, look at a city like San Francisco, its airport's gonna be underwater within 25, 30 years. There's no question, and maybe before that, at a high tide and with the right circumstances and storms, uh, there will be adaptation. It will be at all levels, and the federal government finally will be, will be importuned by people like Senator Rubio to spend money on saving Miami Beach. That just will happen. Uh, as to whether or not we have the good sense to try to anticipate and, and ameliorate the change, I don't see it 
in the absence, frankly, of a disaster. I think if, and we will have one. I think if we have a catastrophic storm, a series of them, the fires continue in California. The scientists are clear, which they have, have not been so explicit about. They're all nervous about saying, well, that's climate change, because you never know if any one incident is climate change. But as they begin to marshal their resources and communicate to the country, I think finally there will be action. But I don't foresee it in the near future. Well, you'd be more optimistic, I think, maybe. I, I think that uh, just two th quick things. One is state and local action is critical. Uh, there's some analysis that, that just the, the states, first of all, the states that make up the U.S. Climate uh, Action Alliance uh, constitute more than 50 percent of the population uh, with the new governors who just got elected in 2018 close to 60 percent of the economy. So that's very important. But you can't, you can't, the U.S. can't do its part particularly given its historic emissions, without federal leadership. So that can only come with a new president and with a, with a change in Congress. And that requires, whether that's the Green New Deal, whether that's uh, a commitment to 100% clean energy, whether it's some variation of a carbon fee, or it has to take place at the federal level and it needs to involve Congress. Obama went about as far, you know, uh, we, Christine and I worked for, for Hillary in the campaign. We could take it a little bit further, uh, so you could do a little bit better than Obama had proposed by 2025. Once you get beyond that, you've got to have congressional action, and the states can't do that alone. In addition to that, uh, another place where this administration is going the wrong way is you need massive new investments in science both the science of climate change and in energy innovation. And that could really, that states can't burden that, can't carry that burden. That has to come uh, from federal action. So I'm hoping that maybe the president will keep the government closed and between now and <laughs> to the 2020 election. <laughs> that, that might produce the circumstances where you had a Congress ready to act and a president ready to, you know, to take action. You're not but worried about your tax I, refund. I still, I still think, <laughs> you know, I still think uh, in, in part we'll see whether the, you know, Democrats compete for this space. I mentioned mm -hmm. friction. Are they going to get in and fight uh, on this question and fight the president on the question of climate? If they do, I think it could state, set the stage for some massive action the way that the uh, 2008 campaign set the stage for the Affordable Care Act. Now, we're still struggling. We're still trying to hold on to it and whatever. But it was because it was injected. In 2004, John Kerry was the presidential nominee. He wanted to expand it. Uh, S chip. It took considerable effort to get politics to turn towards universal coverage again. That happened in the 08 election. The net result was EACA. And I think that could happen in this election, but it goes back to Bill. You have to, people have to show up, they have to fight for it, and candidates need to think, I'm, I'm going to succeed or not succeed because I'm addressing this. this um, you know, this, this topic. That's why I think things like the Sunrise Movement yeah. and whatever are, are important new developments in terms of pushing people towards uh, engaging on the politics of this. So maybe that's a topic we can come back to when we have questions from the floor, which we should get to really soon, but I feel like there are two more topics we should just make sure we cover um, before we open it up for uh, Q&A. And um, one of those is just you know, reminding us of how important the P Paris Climate Accord is. And then the other is your work with India and these track two negotiations. So I think, you know, the first question there is just, you know, remind us real quickly why the Paris Climate Accord is so important. The Obama administration was essential on this. This is kind of the culmination of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which Bill was explaining to us earlier. Um, so you know, what, what made this accord so important and different from, say, Copenhagen, where things didn't work out in 2008? Well, there was a long period of time when we measured progress by specific 
reductions and commitments that countries would make in greenhouse gas generation and in emissions. And that culminated with Copenhagen, where uh, we failed to do it. And it was widely seen, even though there was agreement on a range of issues that were, that were important finally to the conclusions that were reached in Paris, we did not, the world community did not agree on reduction targets for greenhouse gases. And I'll tell you a personal story that uh, influenced me. I served on the board of the Packard Foundation, one of the country's larger foundations and a major funder of environmental and climate related work. And while I was there, we made a commitment of a very substantial amount of money, some $500,000 toward climate works. And it was matched by the Hewlett Foundation, a significant, an equal amount, equivalent amount of money, a little more. 500 million. Pardon? 500, you said 500. I said 500, 500 million, sorry, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, talking real money. That's what, that's, what, that's what happens when you've been in government. You know, thousand a million, what's the difference? At any rate, at any rate um, the uh, Waxman Markey went down, as John described. It failed of passage. Long comes Copenhagen. Copenhagen is interpreted as a failure, as unsuccessful. And I remember the three Packard women who are the core of the board of the Packard Foundation, looked at me and said, you know, the opportunity cost of $500 million is very significant. There's so many good things we could be doing with our money. Uh, you led us to believe we we're gonna get progress on climate. We don't see it. We nearly lost it. And I remember thinking, we really need a win. And in Paris, we got a win. Why did we get a win? Because we gave up on getting specific, mandatory, legally enforceable reduction commitments. That's really, in my view, why it was so successful. That's how we got was 197 countries to agree. The nationally determined commitments was a very practical way of saying, you get what you can get, you get what you can get, I'll get what I can get, and I'm going to applaud you, and you're going to, and so forth. And the Chinese were not asked to do anything more than they were prepared to do. Turned out they were prepared to take it seriously, which for so many years they had not done. At any rate, that's why Paris worked. And of course, it's a little bit like the uh, Montreal Protocol, where you make the initial commitment, you learn the issues, you educate your leaders and your public, and it was a wonderful event for terms of communications all over the world, and gradually you create a consensus, well, we ought to do something, and countries begin to think of doing as much as the na their neighbor country, and why can't they do more, or could they do more, or could they find ways to promote renewables and things of that sort. So it starts the ball rolling, but it does it in a modest relatively unassuming way, undemanding way. And that, in my view, is why it was so successful. And we can build on it, and we have built on it. The, the COP that just existed, that just took place in Poland, made progress more than I thought or expected that they would make, especially without the United States in any way providing leadership. The, the original framework convention that President Bush signed, that Bill worked on, created a, a system of common but differentiated responsibility. And leading up to Kyoto, that was viewed as the traditional big emitters, the advanced economies, had the responsibility for reductions. The newly uh, industrialized economies essentially were off the hook. That's what changed in Copenhagen, and this new context was created. And that culminated in Paris. But the reason why it was believed that that might work was because what just actually happened in, Pol in Poland and Katowice, which was you have to be transparent, you have to have, you have to come back and you have to ratchet ambition up over time as the clarity of the problem becomes more apparent and the ability to do something about it becomes more apparent. So this so-called rule book, for those of you who are really into climate stuff, <laughs> that, just got, that just got developed really is built around being able to monitor what countries are actually doing. Are they meeting their commitments? Sadly, the United States is not. Um, and uh, the transparency is 
intended to create the moral suasion to get people to move, move up and beyond. Uh, Europe actually just put down a plan. It hasn't been, it hasn't been uh, adopted by the, by the Commission and the European Union and the European Parliament, but that would go uh, put uh, Europe in the context that California is in, which is net zero by 2050. Co Economy-wide, net zero by 2050. And so the, that's the kind of pressure and moral suasion that can be applied if essentially you, you have a, a sense of accountability and a transparent system where you can see who's doing what. So why don't we end before turning to, to the audience with the track two negotiations. You're both yeah. here in Boston this week because you're part of this U.S.-India initiative around attract two negotiations <clears throat> on partnership on climate change. So maybe you could just tell us a little bit about that and um, how that's been productive and the challenges there are there as well. Well, I'm new to it. Go ahead, John. Yeah, so this has been going on for um, maybe almost 10 years. Uh, it came out of a different, a tra I don't know if that's a fancy word, track two. You can ask Madeline what that means when she comes and visits with you. Uh, by the way, I talked to her this morning. She's really looking forward to it. I that. actually don't know what it <laughs> means. So <laughs> track two is non-governmental. Uh, people who have connection to the government but, uh, but are not in the government come together to try to prepare uh, information, advice, analysis, and uh, <clears throat> clear some of the air between governments that can happen in a more open and honest way when you're not representing the government, you're just representing your own perspective, your own views. So uh, there's a long-standing dialogue that is run by something called the Aspen Strategy Group uh, that now is uh, run by Nick Burns and Condi Rice um, and, um, um, can't remember, <laughs> uh, a, a Democratic co-chair uh, that looked at strategic issues between U.S. and India, uh, worked hard on the nuclear agreement, the civil nuclear agreement, looked at the regional uh, strategy issues. Out of that dialogue, people decided that there, it, there was a space for a climate dialogue, energy dialogue, an energy poverty dialogue. So we've been doing that for about 10 years. Uh, I had to back out when I was in the government because then I was track one. <laughs> but uh, these things can be very useful. And uh, Bill joined me as co-chair. So we're meeting with Indian counterparts who are trying to influence their government. Uh, to, uh, and one of the things we're going to talk about first thing in the morning, uh, we start tonight, but in the, in the morning, is the tremendous air pollution problems that uh, India has. 11 of the 12 cities with the worst uh, PM 2.5 problems in the world are in India. So uh, China has been stronger at attack, you, particularly if you go to Beijing. If you went to Beijing 10 years ago, it was like going to Delhi today. Uh, and now that choking air pollution problem that's cutting years off the lives of uh, Indian citizens killing 100,000 children a year just because of this massive problem of air pollution is where we're starting off. And I think what we try to find is common recommendations that we could take back to our governments, um, mostly at the national level, but there's also a subnational component to that as well. Is there any kind of one accomplishment over the last 10 years you would highlight that's come out of these, out of this partnership? I think we, uh, I, I think it was very useful in helping prepare. Uh, this started under Prime Minister Singh, uh, and, uh, but at the beginning of the Obama administration. But I think it was very helpful in providing some insight into the relationship between President Obama and, uh, and Prime Minister Modi, and they expanded their collaborative programs, uh, particularly on clean energy, as a result of recommendations of the participants in this dialogue. Most specifically, uh, one of the things that we tackled early on, this may be, now I'm kind of in the climate weeds, 
uh, one of the super pollutants that has an outsized effect on climate changes are hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs, that are used in refrigeration. And there were a number of Indian manufacturers uh, who had a stake in keeping the system as it were. Uh, but through this dialogue, I think we were able to prepare uh, and President Obama, both in his conversations with, pre pre with uh, uh, President Xi and with Prime Minister Modi, were able to create the trust that resulted in something called the Kigali Agreement, which Bill mentioned the Montreal Protocol, is a, through the Montreal Protocol, is going to phase down and hopefully phase out HFCs and refrigeration to be used with more climate-friendly um, uh, chemicals to be used in, or systems to be used in refrigeration. So that was uh, a major achievement, and I think that was something that I think the Indian government would have had a hard time with if there hadn't been preparatory discussions and sort of some information coming into the Indian government that preceded that. Well, good. This is fascinating. I could continue asking you all questions until uh, this evening. Um, why don't we say thank you, and then we'll turn to questions. Thank you so much. <laughs>